Hedwood and Norwood. Uh, he's going, he comes to campus pretty frequently. He has a couple of projects here on campus. So uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to, you have his email address. Feel free to email him. He's really good about responding. He's really interested in linking with students as well. Um, so uh, keep, keep, keep in touch with him if you're interested in, in that kind of uh, work. So this week, our speaker today is Julie Sarris Esmond Edmonds. She's with the Department of uh, Water Resources. She's a landscape, she's been the landscape uh, specialist for the past nine years. She has worked as a technical advisor for the state's green building program and as a member of the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance update, which she's going to talk about some today. She developed a conceptual design for the Save Our Water Waterwise Garden for the 2010 California State Fair. She's a river friendly green gardener, a G3 certified landscape professional, and a UCC master gardener in Placer County. She has a BS degree in conservation biology from Sac State and a career certificate in horticulture from Sierra College. She says her weirdest job was as an insect tracker for Sacramento County A. Um, and she also says she never met a succulent that she didn't like. So, yeah. She's a plant. I didn't know that was still on. <laughs> I, I, I intentionally left that on there. So Julie's going to talk to us about uh, new landscapes, or landscapes for New California. Maybe, hopefully they will. Um, so are you any familiar with the landscape ordinance at all, or AB 1881? Maybe a little bit. Um, Got a lot of slides and a lot of material, so I'm, I'm going to hopefully get through all of it because it's a really fascinating subject. The whole landscape industry is very interesting. So, that in 2006, a law was passed that said that DWR has to update an existing ordinance. And this ordinance went into effect back in 1992, and it was a landscape ordinance. All the cities and counties were supposed to follow this one kind of landscape development. Most of them didn't really follow it. So the legislature, with with uh, recognizing all these issues that California is facing with pollution and our population growth and our infrastructure is maxed out, they passed a law that said we need to look at this again. And to, I'm not going to go through them because I actually brought copies of the ordinance with the law attached to that, so please take one. But these are the most important things. Um, these are the most important provisions, and if you look at them, they're all kind of BMP stuff because we really need to follow best management practices when we install landscapes. They're um, taking over, natural, they're kind of replacing natural spaces, so they need to function and not uh, contribute to the problem. They need to uh, be regenerative and solutions and, uh, and still have their uh, functions met. So the most, most important things are things like uh, minimize overspray and run, sorry, um, group plants in hydro zones. I mean, how, what a concept. We put plants in a place where they'll be compatible with other plants. That really has been a problem. So you have to irrigate them all funny to make them, and they won't survive if they're not in a hydro zone because uh, one is, or the other is going to suffer if their irrigation needs, their water needs are really different. So put them together. They need to be well adapted to our climate. Use native plants or things from other Mediterranean climates. Why fight it? There's many thousands of plants that will grow here in California and do really well without having to have tremendous inputs. Um, increased stormwater retention. You know, we're shedding all of our rainwater you know, to the ocean. We need to keep it on site, let it soak into the ground, and let it move out to the ocean it's more naturally and slowly. You can see they're all really important things, but I'm not going to go through the whole list. But I think one of the problems this system, sorry. That is probably the most important in the provisions. You know, you guys can do a, a great job and build this really great landscape with good plant choices and very artistic and functioning well and gorgeous and then they'll hire a really terrible maintenance contractor who tops your trees and uh, shears your shrubs and um, won't replenish the mulch and those kind of things. So this is something to think about. You know, how, how are they going to maintain it? 
after we've turned over the design and it's been installed. So I'll just put this in real quick. You know, there is actually a law that says it's illegal to waste water. It's in the state constitution. So I just want you to kind of think of that. You know, it isn't, it's very important and it is recognized on the statewide level to not waste water. And this is a very common site in the go. You probably have, since you've been in the landscape architecture program, you've kind of seen the world with new eyes, with new glasses maybe. <laughs> Going around, you're thinking, I wouldn't have used that plan, or I would have done something different here. Or that. Look at the, how the sprinklers are not working properly. Those are the kind of eyes you need to have when you're going around in daily life and just kind of evaluating other people's work. Then you know, then you kind of get an idea of how you can improve on that. So the applicability for the landscape ordinance is mostly new landscapes that are over 25. It's, all new landscapes, but mostly new. I guess that kind of chose my words poorly. So it's new and rehabilitated landscapes over 2,500 square feet. So there'll be public uh, projects and there'll be commercial projects like this campus at Intel and Folsom. It also uh, oh, also involves developer installed home, single family homes. So we'll get to that. So how about Cal Green? Have any of you heard of Cal Green yet? Cal Green is a new California building code. So the landscape ordinance is actually in the building code now as of January. So it's actually something cities and counties have to adhere to from two different directions. Fortunately, they're compatible. They're the same. So it's not like you have one set of rules in to, you know, from the planning department and another set of rules to meet the building code. They're, the, um, they're compatible. They use the ordinance as their baseline. The only difference is that they require dedicated landscape meters on sites at 1,000 square feet rather than 2,500. And what a dedicated landscape meter is, when you have your main line coming in off the uh, street water main, they'll split it. So they'll have one line going into the building and then a separate line with a meter on it going out to the landscape. And that way they can track water use. You can do leak, leak detection by having a separate meter because they know what is going in the landscape and what is going in the building and they can, you can monitor it a lot more easily. And leaks are a big problem in the landscape because things get broken. So those are the mandatory things. They do kind of like lead. They have some voluntary provisions where you can reduce the water budget. And I know Lauren's talked to you about the MAWA before. Uh, they've modified it on a voluntary basis to lower the water budget to uh, even as low as 50 percent of the But that's all voluntary. But you can see it's, it's meant for green building. Rainwater systems, rainwater collection, all these things will kind of give you points in uh, design. So I did mention f uh, single family homes. For developer installed single family homes, I can track a situation like this that's applicable. Now, I said 2,500 feet. Well, these guys are put through the process uh, at the planning department as a project, not an individual basis. So, a tract home neighborhood, there might, the individual front yard landscapes may only be five or 600 square feet. But when they go in and permit, uh, say, 50 homes or 10 homes, or whatever, accumulatively, that's over 2,500 feet, they're using the same kind of a sets of designs throughout the whole complex. They might have three designs or something. They have the same plan palette. So it makes sense to uh, aggregate them. And they're all built the same. So that's why they're applicable. Now if you have a single family home where the homeowner is providing their own landscaping, where they've hired someone or doing it themselves, the applicability jumps up to 5,000 square feet, which would be a less kind of landscape. Did I say 500 Thousand. Five thousand. Five thousand. Okay. <laughs> Five hundred thousand. <coughs> okay. So they have to meet the landscape ordinance too, but you know they're going to most likely um, be hiring professionals anyway. So it's not a it's not a hardship. So there is a Cal Green provision for residential. It's uh, much much less um, comprehensive than the non-residential. The only requirement for uh, Cal Green residential is. Uh, Irrigation controllers that use uh, some kind of sensor-based technology, the weather or soil moisture, and they have to have a rain shut off. They do have the 
voluntary tiers where they can reduce their water budget even further so their model would be even lower, but that again, that's all uh, voluntary. And of course, the model is calculated using uh, ETO from the CINUS network, and this is the CINUS station here on campus, I think. So I just wanted you to see that um, equation, and we'll get back to that. It's not a hard equation. Um, I mentioned BMPs. It was just kind of a coincidence that after we got done updating the ordinance, we looked at the Irrigation Association list of BMPs, and they really tracked. They were this, the, um, almost in the same order. And it was just a pure coincidence, but it was you know, the set of known quantities where we know these are the things that will build healthy and sustainable landscapes. So, and also the provisions of the laws listed them out. So uh, one of them that's really important and uh, has been really ignored is soil management. It's in the state law, and it, we got a lot of pushback from the industry. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to spend the money on it, but we felt, and the law said, this is important, so we put it in the ordinance. And they have to get a soil report. They need to know what's there. They need to know the structure, the texture, um, the pH, uh, if there are some nutrient issues. They need to know that. And they need to tell the landscape designers and the irrigation designers, because you need to know what soils are like, so you can choose the right kind of plants. I mean, in woodland, they don't grow camellias and azaleas in woodland, but I can grow them where I live, just in Sacramento, no problem at all. If you're building a site in Woodland, we need to know that the pH is really high and that a lot of plants are not going to do well there. It's really oversimplified landscape design plan. Uh, we have three main plans in the ordinance. The landscape design, the irrigation design, and the gradient design. I'm just showing this just to show you that, you know, use hydrozones when you're designing. Because the hydrozones come into play both with plant selection and the irrigation. So I talked about plants. They're obviously the most important part of any landscape. Uh, the law says any plants can be used. Nothing is um, off the table except things like noxious weeds, which are banned anyway. But you just have to use them in a water budget uh, to meet a water budget. So one third high water use plants, one third low, and one third medium, or shift it to the moderate and low ends. Um, we highly recommend natives and natural vegetation be retained, water conserving species, pest and disease resistance. That was a stakeholder comment. You know, put that in there. Recommend it. Let make people think about it. You know, do I really want to put this tree in here? Like right now I see all over in Sacramento and Foster County the half bears are just dripping honeydew like crazy. Maybe those trees were not the right choice because they're constantly inundated with pests. So maybe, you know, another tree should have been chosen. Right here is this really interesting little note I gave to myself. There was a law passed last year, AB 1061, and I have a copy of it up there if you want, where it gives people that live in a community with an HOA the right to say, I want to plant what I want to plant. Because a lot of HOAs say you have to have this much turf and you can't have more water plants, you can't have a Mediterranean garden, you can't have cactus, whatever. They say these rules, and people are bound by them if they live in that neighborhood, but that law, sets those rules aside and nullifies them. So people are free to have a native garden, um, a non-turf landscape, a succulent garden, whatever they want, as long as it's not weedy and messy, but you know, fits their aesthetic rules. But that's really important, and I, I hear all the time from designers out there, my HOA won't let me do this, or my customer's HOA won't let me do this. But now this law, um, will let people have a lot more free choice and to make better choices in their landscapes. So things, you know, I kind of wanted to um, talk a little bit more about just the rules. I wanted you to kind of think about, because uh, I know you've had some really great speakers at Barnes Linda, you know, people that are working in the industry, but I wanted you to kind of think about you know, when you're choosing plants and you're doing the design, what's there besides just uh, the form and the color and the composition? And what do I need? What other factors do I need to come up with? You know, things like native plants. Use them. They don't require any irrigation or very little once they're established. And they have the best habitat value. Really. You know, we're taking away natural habitat and putting a house or a shopping center, and then we're putting this landscape around it. 
If that landscape offers very little habitat value, then it's just a big negative. But if you choose some native plants, they will be positive and can return back to the environment. If you don't want some natives, uh, you know, if they don't work for what you're doing, these are animals that are from our sim similar Mediterranean climates that require a lot, a lot less fertilizer and water and um, pruning. You know, why, why generate extra green waste? You know? Climate appropriate, that's the most important thing. Edible landscaping, uh, you know, sometimes in a residential setting it's really appropriate to suggest people using fruit trees for a small shade tree. You know, you can get them that um, are bigger than the semi dwarf that actually will function as a shade tree. You know, a lot of vines have fruits, you know, think about these other things, you know, make it, um, especially in a residential setting, is it going to be more than just looking pretty, you know? Maybe it'll do something for the people that live there, beyond just shade or whatever. And of course, the Arboretum All Stars, which are wonderful. And seek out help from urban forestry groups. You know, there's Sacramento Tree Foundation, there's uh, groups all over the state. They know what trees will grow well where you are at. So when you go out to practice, seek these groups out, like tree people in LA and couple others I can't think of. But they know what does well. They probably would have said don't plant those those hackberries that are going to drip honey do it. So I really can't say enough about trees. You know, think about trees. You know, they're going to be there for a long, long time. You want them to be the best trees for the site you can think of. Trees are really important for water conservation too because they shade and energy conservation. They shade the building, they shade the site, they make it a lot more pleasant and a lot easier for other plants to grow because it makes it cooler. But think of things about the right size. You know, don't, I, gosh, how many of us have seen redwood plant, redwoods planted in a 10 foot suburban lot? You know those trees are going to have to be cut out in 10 years or sooner. Make sure they're long lived. You know, everybody wants to grow these real fast trees that look great in five years and shade their house, but you know, it's not really um, providing much of service to future generations. You know, if we have all these trees that die at of old age at 40 years, you know, then we got to start all over again. So think of trees that are going to live a long time. Don't plant just male trees. You know, a lot of cities spec this out, but they want male trees that are fruitless, so they don't have um, seeds and stuff. But then they get out, everybody has allergy attacks. So think of, you know, don't use fruitless this and fruitless that all the time. And of course, evergreens block the land. That's really important in a lot of places. And one thing we put in the um, landscape ordinance that I thought was really important, we recommended a separate irrigation valve for trees. These trees really need to be watered differently than shrubs. They need to be watered. Once they're established, they need to be watered a couple times a month really deep. Not every three days, like a shrub mine. So think of that when you're designing your landscape. And I really recommend that you become really good at irrigation too. It's it's um, for your future employability. It will make a big difference if you don't understand irrigation. You will be sought out versus somebody that doesn't. So one thing a lot of people were really worried about with these water conservation ordinances is water features. It's really big business in the industry, ponds and fountains. They're really pretty, they block out noise. They offer some wildlife habitat too, so they're, I think they're important. So they just have to be um, put in the hydro zone as a high water use plant because they evaporate water about the same, you know, approximately to grass. So instead of putting in 100 square feet of turf, you would just choose a 100 square foot pond. That's how you would equate it in the water budget calculation. They do need to use recycled uh, water, which is the purple pipe if it's available. And it needs to be recirculated, so a closed loop, so you're not just refilling it constantly and discharging. That actually is a um, water conservation garden in Granite Bay. So they feel that it's appropriate instead of a piece of grass, this is a pond. And it, lots of birds were visiting that day. It's really a respite for them. They need that. You know, if we've taken away and covered over creeks and stuff that these animals need a place to come get a drink. So, slopes, boy, these are awful. This is my poster child landscape in front of the Kmart. 
is so steep they can't, I don't know how they even keep the grass green because when they water it, most of it ends up on the sidewalk. And then I feel really bad for the guy that's got to mow that. It's pretty dangerous. So we followed some guidelines and some landscape architecture texts about 49 is the limit for church slopes. There are a couple caveats. So um, you can put a, a steeper slope with turf in some place like a golf course if the toe of the slope is permeable. So any water that runs off that slope is going to soak into the landscape. But in this situation, where it's hitting the sidewalk and it always goes in the street, that's not acceptable in a new landscape. But it's just, uh, it's really difficult to maintain. It's just very dangerous. This might be a better choice. Nobody needs to walk on that slope. That's just, it's just there. This, so, um, this is probably a better choice for a steep slope in a commercial setting or something like that. Stormwater, I talked about how important it is to soak our water in the ground. That's what it did in nature, you know, before we paved everything over, the rain hit, soaked in, and then the, the, the excess flowed out to sea. But now almost everything is excess because we've channeled our world in such a way that we discharge our water as fast as we can. We've engineered our lots so the watersheds on our roof hits, goes out the gutter, and a lot of older homes have pipes straight from the house gutter right out to the street. So the water has no chance at all to hit the landscape and soak in. But that's changing. And so think about this when you're doing the design. You just, oh, think about how you can incorporate some kind of stormwater BMP as a landscape design feature. This is a parking lot over in Rancho. Uh, it, every time it rained, it flooded. It was unusable, and then that dirty um, stormwater would end up right in the American River. So the landscape contractor crew that worked the site decided we're going to change this. So they went in and trenched all these parking lot islands, and they planted some sedges and some sycamore trees, and they put a little curb cuts in each one. So all the all the stormwater that hits that parking lot goes in these channels and soaks in the ground. And they only come in with a weed whacker once or twice a year to uh, cut the sedges back and kind of clean out the leaves. They don't have to irrigate these trees except for a very brief time in the summer because they've, they've by soaking in all that water in the ground, they've, they've shortened the irrigation season. So they're not only saving water, they're cleaning the water that they're getting. So, think, and so it can be something like this or it can be a rain garden. These are beginning to be very popular in residential settings. Uh, it's not a it's not a water feature because this water is meant to sit there and soak in. So it might sit for a few hours or a day or so if it's been very rainy, but then it soaks in. And they probably looks like they've got a chorus or something here. It can be all kinds of plants. Um, Sacramento County has on their stormwater utility website an amazing, really great guide to building a rain garden that you might think about for your residential customers. You don't have to use uh, just these kind of plants you associate with wetlands. Dry stream beds, dry well. This one, this dry well, is just a nursery pot filled with gravel. It collects all the rain that comes off of one gutter or off of the house that I showed earlier, and it goes in the ground. It doesn't hit the sidewalk. So it soaks in the ground that the trees can take advantage of. It. And I've talked about you don't have to use just boggy plants. This is in Roseville. They're using lavender in the stormwater treatment. So they have these curb cuts right here. So the parking lot runoff comes in here and collects down in this depression. But they've ch um, built this stormwater BMP in such a way that even these lavender are fine. They're above the, uh, the soaking, soaked in water area and the saturated area. So they don't have wet feet and they just do just great there. And they can handle the heat of the parking lot. So keep these things in mind. The second plan I talked about was the irrigation design plan. And uh, one of the most important things, and I, you know, if you work in the irrigation part of the industry too, this is something to think about. But pressure regulation, we talk about that. Uh, the problem with pressure is usually it's too high. And the equipment is built and designed and engineered to run at a certain pressure in a, in a range. And usually the pressure that you get the water from the city is too high. And so you have, uh, it's blown out and it mists and it blows off into the wind and wasted. And um, 
it never hits the ground where it should, or a lot of it doesn't. So, you think about if you ever do any irrigation designing. Too low of pressure is real common in places like uh, parks and ball fields, where they're using rotors that may, or sprinkler heads that may throw 50 feet. They, they're very efficient. They throw a lot of water out, but at a very large area. But they need a lot of pressure to run it properly, so a lot of parks and uh, ball fields and those kind of places, they need to boost their pressure. So these are all kind of parks to think about when you're designing a landscape. This is a, a real good example of blowout from high pressure. This is a pretty new landscape, and they know what they should know what they're doing. It's, the equipment's new, but um, it's not very well designed. They're using sprays in shrub beds, so the uniformity of the water is is blocked by the the shrubs. The, what they call distribution uniformity is really bad because it hits a shrub and then it drops, and the shrub behind it doesn't get any water. Pressure's too high, they're irrigating at 5 in the afternoon on a windy day, so you can see most of the water is either in the air or on, on the sidewalk. So one thing in, that to think about with design, actual landscape design, as it relates to irrigation is in the ordinance, there's a 24 inch setback where for the first two feet from non permeable hardscape, you have to have no overhead irrigation. That doesn't mean you can't plant, and it doesn't mean you can't plant turf. You can, you just have to irrigate it in that first two feet with something besides overhead spray irrigation because it's almost impossible to keep that water in the landscape and not on the sidewalk. There's a couple caveats uh, about um, inside of the park or interior of the landscape, but that's because the water, if it does hit the sidewalk, it'll go back into the landscape. But on the edge, we, our goal is to prevent overspray and runoff. So that's what that does. And that's an example of it. So they've planted right up next to this patio. And here, they have, uh, I think they used uh, Nedifem dripper loam to irrigate this Lizanakia. So they don't have any water hitting their sidewalk or the patio ever, except rain. So that's an, an example. You can put the turf all the way up there. You can irrigate with the subsurface dripper loam with the turf also. Swing joints. Uh, are, are, do any of you have any irrigation experience at all? Okay, so you know, do you, do you ever use swing joints or know what they are? Okay. This is a really easy, cheap piece of equipment that I, I'm really glad that is included in the ordinance. You've probably driven by a site where it's leaking all the time like this, or there's a fountain going on when the sprinklers are running. The swing joint is just a little piece of equipment that you put underneath the sprinkler head and the riser. And if somebody steps on it or drives a bike or a golf cart on it, it won't break the riser. And that seems like no big deal, but in a commercial site, that could, this could go on for years and years and years and years. So the swing joint is a cheap piece of equipment that will prevent that. But there's a lot more going on here than just wasted water. You know, it, it's bad perception of the public. Because people drive by and they subconsciously see that and they think bad things. It also is dangerous. It can be a slip and fall hazard and a liability to the property owner. And I talked about slopes a little bit. We, you know, because of um, irrigation issues and safety, you know, turfs allow on steep slopes. But you can irrigate slopes. Um, this, as long as the precipitation rate is less than 0.75 inches an hour, and there's a lot of equipment that does that. This is an old landscape. This would not fly under the new rules because it's um, probably about 80% turf. So the law says one third, no more than one third of high water use plants. So if they're using cool season turf, they can't have more than one third of the area in that. But the point I wanted to show you is, uh, oops, sorry. This here. Is that moth? That's moth. That's algae. Algae. It's moth. Algae slippery. So the bottom of this hill, they don't have any check valves in the irrigation system. Check valves are another existing cheap piece of equipment. A lot of sprinkler heads are built with check valves already inside them. And what that does is when this sprinkler system turns off and the pressure is gone, all the water that's in those pipes just drains down and oozes out at the bottom. When you have a big site like that with a big gradient, a lot of water is still left in these pipes. So this has gone on for so long 
the, I have other pictures which you can kind of see right here. The pavement's been eroded down to the aggregate because it's gone on for probably 20 years. And then the algae is growing here. So that's another liability. That's a slip and fall hazard. So these are, you know, there's a lot involved and a lot to think about with commercial and public sites and even residential sites. So this I wanted to show you. This is how bad it can be, you know. This is a bad choice in landscape uh, design. This is a kind of steep slope along the, um, a couple of busy streets by the Roosevelt Automall. Kind of rocky, crappy soil, dirt and formation and all that. So water doesn't soak in very good. It just takes a long time to soak in. So they put this turf here. And I took this picture about six years ago. And at the time, there were purple leaf plums and redwood trees. And the purple leaf plums were all in decline. The redwood trees were not looking very happy. The purple leaf plums were dying. There's so much water coming off the site. They're growing cattails in a vacant lot. They have enough. They're irrigating this turf so heavily that they can keep the turf green and grow a wetland, an unintentional wetland. This happens all the time in a commercial setting because nobody's out there checking it. Nobody takes ownership and so on. So I'm thinking, what's going on with that site? So I went by last year and took another picture. It's still going on to the point they're growing willow trees in a vacant lot. All the purple leaf plums are gone and dead, and the redwood trees are dying. So they're over irrigating to the point that the redwood trees are dying because the soil can't hold that water and let it drain. It just kind of sits there on that volcanic car pan. And it all runs off, and you've got this artificial wetland. And you can see by the pictures, you know, this is in the middle of summer. This isn't spring runoff. This is summer. It's all brown out here beyond where the runoff flows. So, so maybe they shouldn't have put turf there because they know the soil, if you read the soil report, you know the soil is not perfect. It's, it's rough. It's volcanic mud. So they probably have a little bit of compost on top, and that's what the turf is living in. And all the water is running out underneath. Narrow planting areas, this is another one of my bugaboos. It's in the ordinance, it was in the original ordinance from 92. Um, no areas less than eight feet wide can be irrigated with overhead irrigation because it's just impossible to irrigate efficiently. Overhead with sprays in less than eight feet wide. I mean, you have to tinker with it and use the best equipment and you might be able to get it work sometime. But you know, is the strip of uh, grass really functional here? <coughs> People don't walk on it. There's no bus stop. There's really, what, you know, what is it there for? I don't know. And it, it is also really common for, uh, in the past for medians in the middle of streets to have turf. And somebody had to go out there and risk their life and mow that grass every two weeks. So no longer. They can still area, have narrow planting areas. They can still have narrow grass areas. They just have to irrigate it with uh, something besides overhead spray. So it's not that we're trying to take away creativity, we're just trying to create solutions. So if somebody really needs that narrow turf area, they can still have it. They just can't irrigate it overhead. So maybe this is a better choice. So you can take the star jasmine or whatever and you strip on it and it'll be happy and it looks just as green and just as attractive, if more, more so. So the third plan I mentioned was the grading plan. I'm not going to spend really any time on it. Uh, I uh, just wanted you to think about it when, when you're grading. Obviously, there are building codes to meet as far as um, keeping the foundation of the building dry and shade and water. But once you get beyond that immediate building footprint, think about how the grading can be done to preserve the soil, to minimize infiltrate. I mean, minimize compaction and maximize infiltration. You know, healthy soils build the soil and don't ruin it. Don't compact it. Just uh, driving the vehicles across the soil will destroy the structure. And it's the last thing you want if you want your plants to live. So anyway, resources. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, please search them out. River friendly in Sacramento County. Bay friendly down in the Bay Area. Ocean friendly is a program put on by Surfrider. The Sacramento County Rain Garden Guide. Um, if you're going to work in the desert, Coachella Valley has a really great guide on um, desert landscaping. There's a big program in Cal Southern California called California Friendly. And there's all the water agencies just about have their own programs. So locally, 
talk to your water agency. They, a lot of them have gardens you can go visit. They have rebate programs, they have classes, so find out what's available, where you're gonna live and where you're gonna practice. Um, my agency has partnered with the water agency group in Save Our Water, and um, one of the things we did this, this year was the State Fair Garden, and I've got some pictures. Um, there's a lot of interest in gray water. People are really thinking about it. It's, it's water that comes out of your shower and your bathroom sink, not sewage, it's just, um, Gray water out of the shower. Um, the authority has changed, but the regulations have loosened, so it's a lot easier for people to use it. So you might, at some point, have people asking for gray water systems. So it's a good idea to learn about how that works and the rules behind it. Um, this is another great organization you should find out about, the Irrigation Association. They have classes, they have certification, uh, they have a store for really good books. But um, I think the certification is probably the most important thing. We require an irrigation audit, which is kind of an inspection at the end of the system design. And you have to be a certified irrigation auditor to do it. So that's something to think about as a career choice, you know, in addition to being an architect, is being an auditor. They'll seek you out. And this is my other resources we have. We, uh, they've upgraded CEMIS, and I think it's really cool. I'm not an expert on it, but I, I like to show the pictures. But they have, uh, with remote sensing, they've mapped out the whole state on a data basis, so you can see what it looked like back last July and back in January. So the brighter the color, the higher the ET of that day. In April, you can see it's getting kind of warm down in the desert. We had a storm come through in May and cooled the state off. And again, there it is in June. You can see the desert starting to get hot with that red blotch. So anyway, <coughs> thought I would show you that. This is a publication that the Cooperative Extension has come up with, and we publish it for them and give it out. It's on um, one of these flyers up here. Please take one. It's really valuable when you're doing a landscape design, because there's a plant list that tells you it's a high medium of water, a low water using plant. So you can easily figure out plants that are compatible with each other, at least on their water use, not anything else. And I had that one last thought. I had nothing to say about it other than I thought it was funny. So, <laughs> garden on the go. That's the State Fair garden that we had, and uh, it was really exciting. It was just a few raised beds and planters, but it gave people the idea that low water gardens aren't ugly, they aren't just brown sticks. They aren't just cactus, even though cactus are beautiful. Some people think they aren't. So they, we let them know, you know, you can use something beside what you think. And a lot of them were shocked to find out that they were already using these low water plants. And they just didn't know it. So I'm, built, I'm writing a guidebook. And I would appreciate any input anybody has for me. What, what they think people need to know or what, what they don't understand about the ordinance and things like that. So there I am, and I have cards up here. Um, please feel free to take any of these publications. I have the ordinance. I also brought the PDF white paper, which talks about water budget a little bit, and some other brochures. Did I make you all go to sleep? <laughs> you were talking about purple pipe. I have yep. never seen it in Northern California. Is that mostly a Southern California no. thing? Um, it's all over in Sacramento, Pastor Kim. It is. Yeah. So they have yeah. all it's over the Bay Area, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tertiary treated recycled water that's produced at a wastewater treatment plant. And in Sacramento, they produce it at a nuclear plant. And it's a purple, just like your sweater. Yeah, so it's for, for new yeah. additions, they have two systems. They have a purple pipe system. Well, it's not really widely used in residential settings yet. But whenever they, so it's in places that are grown. So if it's not a community that's growing quickly, you're probably not going to see it. But they're pre in a lot of Pastor County and Sacramento. And um, it's for cross pollution control, is why it's a different color. So it doesn't accidentally get hooked up to potable water. But they use it in Serrano as a residential setting. Well, I was just going to say that um, we went on a we talked about this in, the, in our construction documents course, LDA 160, and our teacher was saying that occasionally they use like purple joints 
at on in residential things to signify that it's like a that kind of line, but not necessarily like purple piping. Which I, I like is that common? You yeah. know, I think um, they're supposed to use the entire system is supposed right. to be purple. Okay. Because if you cut into a, if you dig a hole and you got two two pipes. If this one of them is not purple or with purple marking, you don't know which is purple and which is tertiary treated. Tertiary treated is filtered and disinfected. It's not going to make you sick, but it's not potable quality, so you're not supposed to drink it. But chances are it will be okay. <laughs> but I, you know, nobody wants to drink it because you don't you don't want to take the chance, and it's not meant for drinking. And that's why the entire system. Sprinkling heads are supposed to be purple, the solenoid valve assembly, the pipes, the whole so cool. even the valve boxes, the valve box. yeah, are supposed to be purple. And that's to keep people from digging in and connect cross connection. Yeah. Can you irrigate uh, little uh, edible gardens with puddle water? With the recycle? Uh -huh. Yeah. You can. Yeah, it's tertiary treated, meaning it's it's disinfected, disinfected. and filtered. <laughs> And um, it's safe to use. Usually, it's lower quality water too, though, so you have to be careful. You have to yeah. get the get the uh, water analysis. So, Santa Clara Valley Water District had issues with irrigating um, public parks and golf courses with reclaimed water because it's high in salts. It can be, especially salts. if the original source water is high in salts, like the Colorado River water that the state of California uses, along with that. And it's already, their fresh water out of the tap tastes bad because it's yeah. kind of salty. So when you treat it, you know, the, 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 you know, the recycled water is very high. Can, I mean, it's not like ocean water, but it, it is higher than potable water. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of yeah. these things you're talking about is regulations. So who enforces these regulations? Depends, I guess. A lot of the stormwater stuff is regulated by the regional water quality control boards. Um, but the ordinance water itself. Cops to go off and check. They have I'm water sorry. Cops to go off and check or, 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 well, it depends so on the district. Yeah, if, if the water agency, the water agency is usually overseeing the water waste, but the landscape ordinance, the law was written so the landscape ordinance has to be implemented by the city and county planning departments. So it's actually a planning tool. It's a permitting review tool, so that when they go before the landscape is even built, they have to meet these requirements. Like it, like the building, and but can they be fined or? It depends on the local. Right. It's all that's all local. Yeah. Yeah. So some agencies will, and some will not. Most of them. Where did you say that we can find help um, building a rain garden? The Sacramento County Stormwater Utility. But you know what? You just Google rain gardens and you'll yeah. get jobs and information. But that one's a good one because you know it's it's meant. With local, with local, you know, exactly. local soils, right. local plants. Yeah. And you can see it actually, they have their demonstration burn at the new um, animal control facility on Grouch. And you know, another good place for gardening information that you mentioned just at the beginning is the UC Master Gardener to the neighbor county, or yeah. most of the counties. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah um, you mentioned 2,500 square feet for a new landscape of a home. And then if you install it yourself 5,000 square feet, but what is the water usage? Like, how many gallons or cubic feet are you saying is, is adequate for that type of space? Well, it's it depends where you're at, and, and it's dependent on the size of the landscape. The 2,500 square feet for homes is only developed and installed like tract homes. The 5,000 square foot is for a single family home where the owner is him or herself either doing it themselves or hiring an architect or a contractor. So you're just saying that that's the side of the landscape that's, that's authorized? Yeah, that's, really when they, well, that's when the rules kick in. I see. Okay. So if it's a smaller site, right. like a single family home, like they're doing uh, just a custom home and their landscape, it's not lot size, it's landscape. So if their landscape's only 3,000 square feet, then they, they fall under the rules. Okay. But they should, you know, try to follow them, but the reference number I think that you're looking for is the MAWA number, the maximum applied water allowance, and that depends mm -hmm. on your landscape or some calculations. Yeah, I have That's the reference time. number. It's, uh, it's based on your location, 
So you have your E2 for your local area. Who is that right there? 0.75. So you have this number that you get from like the center station or the tech reference tables. Okay. And then the area. So it's different in every single place. So this is local, this is your site, and then you adjust it by 70%. And that means you get 70% of the amount of water that the same size area would need. Using the SIMIS station protocol, you know, they have these set of levels um, so that they're all um, consistent. Okay. Well, so I think what we'll do, because there's a class coming in here at 1 o'clock, if you want to come up, we'll end right now because it's a few minutes before we on. Well, and right now, if you want to come up, grab some of these uh, handouts. I'd love to do that. And you can uh, ask Julia a question. Thank you. Thank you, Julia.